pick up where we left off this morning, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, you know, Matthew chapter 5 is the Beatitudes where Jesus begins to give us this, this amazing revelation of uh, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, uh, uh, blessed are the poor. And he begins to unfold, and it wasn't just chapter 5. If you've got a red letter edition Bible, he goes on in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And, and he just begins to reveal uh, uh, amazing, amazing spiritual dynamic truths that man had never heard before. And Jesus said, heaven and earth pass away, but my word will not pass away. Now, last month, as I was crying out to God and seeking God, I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, son, he said, I, I want you to really, you know, you're 66 years old. He said, I, I want you to really make a decision in your heart where from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, you will be deeper and higher and further in me than you were at the beginning. For in other words, I want, I want you to grow up. That's what he was saying. I want, I want you to grow up into the fullness of the statue of Christ. I want you to mature. I want you not only to reclaim lost ground, I want, you to, I want you to apprehend more. I want you like they went into the land of Canaan. Now, I don't know. I, I prayed this tonight. I don't know if you know this, but God told Joshua and Caleb, he said, listen, when you're going into Canaan, you're not going to take all of Canaan at once. He said, because if you did, he said, there would be nobody there to take care of the cities and the towns and the vineyards and the orchards. He said, you're going to progressively take it. He said, that way they're going to maintain it for you until it's yours. And so what God wants us, the Bible says he, he, that, that we are to go from strength to strength. But, but we all with open face, beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image or likeness from glory to glory. Say from glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now that's what our spiritual walk should be like. It should be from glory to glory to glory. But sometimes they're being kicked from pillar to post. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down, sometimes we're on fire, and sometimes, come on, we're lukewarm. Sometimes, yes, here we go, Jesus, and other times it's like, uh, you know, and, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, do, do you know Jesus brought those men and those women into a place of such dynamic spiritual life that the world had never seen within three and a half years? Accelerated growth. How many want accelerated growth? I mean, supernatural. I mean, thank God for the progress we've made. But, but I have to admit, as I look over my life and uh, the things I've experienced and, 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 and the things I've gone through, and I'm thinking, you know what, I, I, really, I really should be a lot more mature than what I am. See, your physical body reaches its fullest maturity when you're 25 years old. 25 years old, and then all of a sudden things begin to go downhill. But you know what, that doesn't have to be true spiritually. That there is, there is no, you're, you're not going to apprehend everything that God has for you in this life. Now, Paul said, I'm striving, I'm pressing. Now, listen, when Paul wrote that in the book of Philippians, I mean, Paul had tremendous revelation. If you, if you really study the books that, the epistles that Paul wrote, I mean, I mean, I, I, you could give yourself a year to just Ephesians chapter 1 or chapter 2 or chapter 3 and not squeeze all the revelation out of it. But Paul said in Philippians, he said, you know what? He said, I have not yet apprehended all that I've been apprehended for. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, that those things that are trying to hold you back, trying to hinder you, trying to limit you, this one thing I do, forgetting those things. Now, I'm not talking about their testimonies. I'm not talking about answered prayers. I'm not talking about visitations. I am talking about the things of this world, the discouragements, the distractions, the cares of life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the hurts, the wounds. He said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth towards those things which are before. And then he says, I press. If you study this in the Greek, it means there's an aggressive effort. How, how many know, how, how many have ever watched the Olympics? You ever see someone win a gold medal? You know what? Those, those people who won the gold medal, they didn't get it accidentally. I mean, there had, there had to be a price that was paid. 
There had to be some commitment. There had to be some dedication. There had to be some determination. There had to be a dream. There had to be a vision. There had to be a desire to attain that gold medal. And, and, and you know what? If you're going to grow spiritually, because this is what we're talking about, if you're going to grow spiritually from where you're at now, it's not going to come on you like ripe cherries off a tree. You've got to decide by God's grace, by God's will, by God's word, by God's spirit, I am going to grow more. See, in the great house, listen to this now, because a lot of people don't understand what brings the move of God. What brings the move of God is a man or a woman who's got into the right position. It is. I tell you, I'm going to show you Jesus tonight. How many you know that Jesus was the absolute perfect illustration of how God works? Perfect illustration of how God works. And you can follow this pattern. And you then, see, after Jesus discipled and trained and taught his men how to live, walk, talk, think, and operate where he did, because he had them with him 24 hours a day, except when he went up to pray in the mountains, he, he, three and a half years, and, and, and after the resurrection, he appeared unto him for 40 more days, and then he ascended to heaven, and next thing you know, here comes the day of Pentecost. And then you begin to see these men from, the Bible says, he that hath clean hands will go from strength to strength, from glory to glory. That's what we read transformed from glory to glory. Remember God's original plan, Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our likeness and our image and let them have dominion. God's never lost sight of that purpose. God wants a people that is one with him. In, in word, in thought, in, desi in desire, in deed, in action. And Jesus said, the works that I, wow, this is, this, man, I'm about ready to shout, man, this stuff is burning in me. He said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. Now, Peter got baptized in the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. I mean, and, and, and he stood up, and a river flowed out of him, and 3,000 got saved. But a couple days later, all of a sudden, he's going into the temple, and a man who's been lame from his mother's womb that he knew his whole life, and even Jesus walked by, but see, there's timings in God. And all of a sudden, Peter looked and he perceived, it's time, it's time. See, it's all, you, you, gotta, you gotta know that you know it's time. H have you ever had that? There, there's times whenever I've moved in the gifts of the supernatural and miraculous, and I knew it was time. I just knew it was time. God was gonna raise somebody up from the dead, or God was gonna heal someone, or God was gonna do something. But I had to be in a position where I could be used of God. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and the silver, but of wood and of earth. Now listen to this. But if a man will purge himself of these things, he will be a vessel unto honor, meet for the master's use, and prepared to every good work. Now, if you're a part of what we call the fivefold ministry, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, he gave us what? For the perfecting. Listen, say perfecting. perfecting. The perfecting, and that, the word perfecting, I'll look at this tonight a little bit. It means the maturing or the developing the molding, the shaping for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, when you have your children, you, you don't try to suppress your children. You want your children, I want my boys and my daughter to do more than what I could ever hope or dream. That's really what, what my purpose is. My purpose is to disciple my children, and I want them to move in the things of God where I never did move. And when you're successfully discipling people, you will bring them into a position where God can flow through them. That's what Jesus did. Aren't you glad Jesus succeeded? Wow. Aren't you glad Jesus succeeded? And the next thing, here Peter is, sometime later, Peter has attained such a position of, of faith and obedience and compliance in God to where the people knew something was different about Peter. There's something different about him. And it was Christ in him. And a river opened up. See, we, we've got the Holy Ghost now. You understand that. You've got the Holy Ghost, but the whole, does the Holy Ghost have us? Last Sunday I talked about being filled. Now, we're seated in heavenly places. We already have all blessings in heavenly places. But it says that you might be filled 
with all the fullness of God. Can, can you see that? You can be filled. Well, I'm not an apostle. So, no, no, it's not, it's not limited to apostles or prophets or advanced pastor teachers. We're here to help you get there. Of course, we can't take you there if we don't live there. So the Lord spoke to me last month. He said, son, he said, anything that is hindering your spiritual growth, out with it. Out with it. He said, now you know how to grow spiritually. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be, the man of God may be perfect. Say perfect. 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 Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's not it excites you. And so I, I just, I just decide that. I just said, okay, okay, does that, is that going to, now I'm not talking about not spending time with your family or working in the garden or doing what you need to do. I'm just saying, is, is, this, is this what I'm about to watch? Is this I'm about to get involved in? I, I, how many have ever had dead end alleys in your life? I've had a lot of them. One of them was a major Ishmael in my life when I built the house up on the hill. And I just began, about two weeks ago, I just finally said enough. That house has got to be sold. And I got a phone call last night from your daughter-in-law and said, good news, your house is sold. <laughs> Praise the Lord, after all these years, got that Ishmael off my back, you know? And, and so this is, I said, Lord, I don't want anything to hinder me from going where I'm supposed to go now. I'm wasting enough time in my life. I've wasted too many days and months and years and decades, and I want to get where I need to be. Why? For, for, for not my benefit. My, I'm not talking about trying to get saved. My name is already written down in heaven. I, I'm loving God. I'm serving God. But I, I want to be in a position, and I want to help people to get into a position where, wherever you go, God will show up. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Hallelujah! Amen. That was a ray there. Hallelujah! God will show up! Hallelujah. And that's where God wants you. Now, it's not about us. It's about him because we're nothing but vessels for his glory. So I, I said, okay, Lord. And, and I can tell you that from that day to this moment, I know that I know from morning to night, Every day I've gone to bed from that time to now, I have grown more. Well, I'm not quite apprehended what I've apprehended in the past. Brother Howard was saying that to me this morning. He said, Pastor Mike, you, you know where you used to walk. I said, yeah, I know. She, he said, Pastor Mike, we got to get back there. I said, yeah, not only there, but we got to go way beyond that. We got to go way beyond where we used to be. But it's easy to let the devil deceive us. So Jesus gave these beatitudes. And then he made an amazing statement. And on Monday night when I was at that pastor's conference in Lancaster at the worship center. And that precious sister who's a missionary reaching islands in the Pacific with her husband and her team that no one has ever preached in. I mean, what, what, man, I'm a little bit jealous of her. She's going to fertile ground where no one's ever heard the gospel. And she, they're leading them to the Lord left and right. Let me tell you something. The reason why, and the Lord sent me into the deepest part of the Philippines, back into the bush where they haven't seen white people since World War II. I'm so glad that sent me there. It was so easy to lead them to Jesus, get them filled with the Spirit, get them healed and on fire. I'm telling you, it was so easy. I begged God to let me stay there. And within a number of years, we started 25 churches like it was nothing. And those churches are still there. I heard there's 55 churches that have come out of those churches now. But those people had nothing to live for. They were living in bamboo huts, dirt floors, uh, very little technology. And so when I brought the gospel to them, they took a hold of it. And they saw the vision. And I was sharing with you this morning that without a vision of people perish. Now, here's the vision you got to get a hold of or, or nothing will ever happen. Your purpose in life is to grow up and to be just like your big brother. That's what your purpose is. Your purpose is to mature, to be developed, to let the potter take you as fresh clay and to mold and shape you into his likeness and into his image where you talk like him, you think like him, you walk like him, you act like him, you desire what he desires, his nature, his character, his personality, 
that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then the glory comes. Then the miracles come. God is looking. Listen, God is looking. It's not we're trying to get God to move. God, it, it's hard to find people who have this hunger to where all they want to be is just like God. Just like God. That's all they want to be. I just want to be like Jesus. You know, we used to sing that old song, and if I sang it, you'd put your fingers in ears. To be like Jesus. Remember the most simple songs? To be like Jesus. All I ask is to be just like him. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? See, that's the vision, that's the plan, that's the purpose. And when Christ came into this earth, he was conceived as a perfect human being in the womb of his mother. But you know what? He wasn't mature yet. Jesus had to grow, and I'll show you that. But notice what he says here in verse 48. Jesus says this to those who are listening. Now, it's not just to his disciples. There's a multitude of people there, and he, say, he makes an amazing statement. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. <laughs> Jesus said, be perfect. Oh, we can't be perfect. Oh, yes, you can. You look to God. Now, we're not talking about perfectionists. We're not talking about somebody that has to have everything exactly in its right location. Because if you study the word perfect there, and actually the word perfect is used over 50 times in the New Testament, you ought to look it up. It's amazing what the word perfect means. But it means to be finished, to be complete, a perfect likeness, a perfect work, a perfect system, to become just like Jesus in word, deed, action, thought, desires, attitude, in character and personality, to be, now that's what I said, to be fully informed, to be completely skilled. Now this is, there's four different uh, definitions. To be completely skilled as men, perfect in use of arms, perfect in discipline, complete in moral excellence, manifesting perfection, perfectly in tune. How, how many of you play some kind of instrument? Now, now if, 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 if I have a guitar, but I cannot use my own natural ears to bring that in tune. I just can't because it, it just, you know, some people's hearing. Now, some people have perfect pitch. And if you have perfect pitch, some people have perfect pitch. And you can, and, some, and, and I, we had a piano player that used to come, and he was a piano tuner. And he would come, and a lot of these guys, they would use the equipment. This guy, he didn't. He'd go down each key, and he'd be in the back of that piano, and he had perfect pitch. He knew exactly where each key belonged in its, in, in, its, in its pitch, in its tune. Let me tell you something. How can we become perfectly in tune with God? Listen to this now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, perfectly in tune. <laughs> Woo! Isn't that exciting to some people? Perfectly in harmony with God. In your thoughts, in what you say, the steps of a good man are order to the Lord. And, and there's times in our life we begin to hit that, I call it a sweet spot. You ever hit that sweet? It says the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, under the spout where the glory pours out. Any, any of you ever, wasn't that a wonderful experience? How many have ever been under the spout where the glory poured out? How, how many have ever been where the Holy Ghost just came in? I, I know that someone's just telling me, I think it was Pastor Pete, he said he, he gave a prophetic word to somebody, and they came to him, and they said, oh, Brother Pete, that was right on. Wasn't that just last week? And he, he said, I don't remember what I said. Has that ever happened to you, Pastor Gary, where you prophesied and the people were amazed? Because and, 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 why? You were under the spout where the glory came out. You were perfectly in tune with the Spirit. Now listen to me. Jesus was perfectly in tune with the Father 24-7. Woo! I mean, so we've got a man speaking who's living what he's preaching. He's not just preaching He's living it. He's walking it. He's doing it. He's the word in the flesh. And he's been tempted and tested and tried. And he came out of the wilderness of the power of God. Remember when he was two years old and they took him. Or uh, uh, when he was 12 years old, he, they took him to the temple. Now listen, he, he wasn't mature in his mother's womb. Now he was a perfect baby. But, but you know, you could be a perfect two-year-old. But, but if, if, if you're acting like a two-year-old when you're 20, something's wrong. Would you agree with that? 
If you're acting like a two-year-old, I mean, a two-year-old usually is still filling his diapers. How many of you want to fill your diapers at 20? You don't, right? You want to mature. You want to grow up. You know, I think that's exactly why we have 1 Corinthians 13. It says, when that which is perfect is coming, when, and then that which is imperfect shall be passed away. And he says, but when I was a child, notice that when I was a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put with a child's things. I told you what happened to the kid, the prodigal son, in the pig pen. He was immature all those years. Now, he was his father's son. But he took his father's wealth and he blew it, didn't he? And ended up living in the flesh and ended up living with the pigs. But one day, say one day. Oh, I pray for that day for the body of Christ the bride. One day, the light turned on. He's sitting in that filth of the pigs. And the light turned on and he said, what am I doing here? I'm going to go back home to my daddy. Notice, that's a part of why Jesus grew up. Because the very first thing, I gave you five reasons why Jesus matured. And number one, he knew he was here to mature, to grow, to fulfill the father's plan. At, at 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business. You, you know, I, I tell you that. That is one of the first scriptures that hit me as a 19-year-old brand-new baby. I was reading my New Testament. I was reading in the military Bible and, and uh, King James, and I read where Jesus said to Joseph and Mary, Know you not, I must be about my father's business. And that hit me like a sledgehammer, like a lightning bolt. Boom! I must be about my father's business. When I got that, I was thinking at the time, because this... This, this salvation is so perfect. God does everything perfect. He's the father of lights in whom there's no vermouthness, not a shadow of turning. Your salvation is perfect. He did it perfectly. Every step, every word, every miracle, every, oh, I'm so excited. Everything Jesus did was perfect. Ah. Uh, how he conducted himself, how he ministered to people, how he raised the dead, he cleansed the lepers, and opened the eyes of the blind, and caught Lazarus out of the tomb after four days. Lazarus, come forth. Everything Jesus did from his conception until his ministry, until his sufferings, until his death and his resurrection, he did everything perfect. <laughs> perfect he overcame principalities and powers and made her show them openly triumphing over them in it pastor mike have you done everything perfect are you kidding me you know how much of a mess i've made of stuff but aren't you glad for his blood and his mercy Oh, I lean heavy on the mercy of God. But that doesn't give us an excuse to keep living in perfect lives. So Jesus, here he is, 12 years old. For three days, the leaders of the nation, the religious leaders, and they ran the nation, they're absolutely amazed by a 12-year-old boy who's asking and answering questions, and he keeps them in thought for three days. Now listen, a normal 12-year-old boy could only keep them people in thought for maybe five minutes. But I'm telling you, I am totally convinced that Jesus at 12 years old was the most perfect human being and the most mature human being that had ever walked the face of this earth at 12 years old. 12 years old. Now, the amazing thing is the father told him, yeah, you're, you're, you're mature. He was. He was mature. He was developed. He, was, he, 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 he had cultivated because, remember, there's five things in his life that he did. He knew he had a vision. I must grow. I must fulfill. And matter of fact, what's the last thing he said on the cross? What's the last thing? It is finished. What was finished? I've completed my Father's will. He was made perfect through suffering because of obedience. You know, a lot of people don't like to suffer, but what you don't understand is you will never become perfect except through sufferings. What do you mean? You're going to stand on God's word in the midst of the suffering. 
It says he became perfect through obedience because of the things he suffered. What did he suffer? He suffered the lies. He suffered the torment, the torture, the physical affliction, the abuse, the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, in the garden, he sweated as it was great drops of blood. That perfection came. He became the perfect author of salvation. Now, don't misunderstand. There's two different kinds of perfections here. See, when Jesus left heaven, he left behind his maturity. But when he came from his mother's womb, see, he, he had this, number one, he had this purpose. Number two, he had a nonstop intimate relationship with the Father. I mean, it wasn't talk. It was real. Him and his Father were connected. Remember, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. You know, God's offering us the same perfection. What do you mean? But it's not us. It's Christ in us. Remember, the perfect one. I said he's perfect. He did everything perfectly. He lives in us now. <laughs> the perfect one lives in you. Let's read what Jesus said again. Listen, listen to what Jesus said. Say, Jesus said this. Jesus said, be therefore perfect, even as my Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, the perfection he's talking about is discovered in these scriptures, and we shared it this morning. It means maturity. Perfect love, perfect joy, perfect peace, perfect long-suffering, perfect patience. How many of you have your patience has come to the level of total maturity? I was telling you this. I, I learned a lot in the last couple of months because, you know, what happened is, is, first of all, my wife and daughter put me on a diet. And I had to change a lot of things to get this nice slim look. <laughs> 30, 52 pounds I lost. But I didn't like it. My flesh didn't like it. I had to give up my butter and my potatoes and the other stuff I like. But you know what? Now I'm so glad. But I learned something that change only comes when you decide you've had enough. So I said, I want change. I've come to that place spiritually. Now I've been there before. I said, but Lord, I want change. I know what you can do. I've seen what you can do. I've experienced what you can do. I don't have to read other men's stories. I've, 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 I've experienced you, God, in tangible ways. I've experienced you, and it's still there for me. But I've got to pay the price. Now, it's not works because you understand. It's first, you've got to have a purpose. Number two, you've got to have constant intimate relationship. Number three, you've got to hide the word in your heart. You've got to put the word first. David said, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, you may not know it. I taught two sermons on unbelief, dealing with unbelief in the last couple of Thursdays. You ought to watch it because unbelief is one of the greatest enemies in the church today. We say we trust God, but do we trust God? Our works prove different. Our actions, our words, our, 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 what we're doing. And so unbelief got into the heart of man when Adam and his wife sinned. So that uh, unbelief, matter of fact, Jesus went to his own hometown and he could only heal a few sick folk. And he marveled at their unbelief. He said, if the miracles I had done here in this nation had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented a long time ago. Listen, America is so full of unbelief. And that's why I said when I went to the Philippines, those Filipinos, man, they could, they, I, I mean, I'd lead them to Jesus. I'd lead them into the Holy Ghost. I'd begin to teach them the Bible. And I'm telling you, in a matter of weeks, they were out there laying hands on the sick, healing the sick, uh, getting people saved and getting people filled with the Holy Ghost in a matter of weeks. But see, we think we're smart. We think we're sophisticated. We got all this technology and we got all these distractions and really it's hindering us. And then they have no choice. They don't have the medical world. They don't have the insurance world. They don't have the banks. So guess what they've got to do? They got to learn how to trust God. I think we're going to come to that place in America. And I think we just went through a period where we're going to have to learn how to trust God. We're going to have to learn to put our confidence in God and not in the arm of the flesh. And so the word, the word, and of course the next thing is faith. Faith. I mean, with, without faith. And then, of course, when Jesus, when he finally hit 30 years old, the father said to him, okay, it's time, son. Now listen, notice what the last initial step is. Remember now he's got a purpose. He's in 
24-7 relationship with his father. He's got the word. He's the word manifested in the flesh, and it just, it just didn't come to him. But he devoured the scriptures. I guarantee he was a diligent student of the word because when he was 12 years old, he, he was so deep. He was so deep to where the experts spent three days with him, and they were astounded by him. And now here, here he is at 30 years old, and he's got faith. He has, he, unbelief has no control. Unbelief has nowhere in his heart. You know, we ought to be growing in faith. You know, what a, you know what a mighty oak tree is? It's simply an acorn that held its ground. I mean, I got born again. I was just a little acorn, just a l- little seed, and, and I just held my ground. And, and the reason why I haven't developed, you know, it's amazing because all around us we see the declaration of the revelation of this truth. We see nature. We see it in animals and, and fish and uh, uh, plants, and we see it in the, in the birds, we see it in the insects, and we see it in human beings. There is a progressive growth, but you've got to decide to grow. You know, we got a garden, and we've got some zucchini plants that are humongous, and then we got a zucchini plants that are real small and, 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 and not being developed. Why? There's something wrong. No, there's nothing wrong with the seed. There's something wrong with the soil. There's something going on with that seed. Listen, the reason why we're not growing spiritually is not because God's word is enabled. He, 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 he's more than able, isn't he? Yeah. Now unto him that is, is more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But why do some Christians really grow like Stephen? I mean, Stephen, he, 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 here he is, he's just a man. And, and, and they said, you need to find seven guys full of the Holy Ghost. And, and we're going to give ourselves to nothing but the Word of God in prayer. That's where ministers ought to be. We ought to be in the Word of God in prayer. And so what happens? Out of all of these seven guys, there's a guy by the name of Stephen who's full of faith, and he's full of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he's growing. Now, the proof in the pudding is in the eating. So we'll find out if what I'm preaching is true. We'll find out if what I'm saying is true. Because if it's true, if, if the key to all that God has is spiritual growth, you're going to find out real quick. If I will stay the course. If I will keep seeking him. If I'll keep pursuing him. If I'll keep the purpose and the vision in front of me. My job is to grow spiritually, for I can affect the multitudes. Jesus gave it a tremendous example. They said to him, "Uh, teach us, Master, how we can move where you lived. He said, it's like this. There's a seed. He said, and you take that seed and you plant it in the soil. That's your heart. He said, then that seed will spring forth. It springs up. And then he said, there's a blade, isn't there? Huh? And then that blade becomes an ear in that blade and then it becomes a full ripe ear he talked about the mustard seed he said it's the smallest of all seeds but when it's planted and it's nursed and it's hold its ground it would become the greatest herb there is with branches that will spread out and birds and animals will come and make a dwelling in that place so why do some christians take off and grow fast spiritually And other Christians, they just struggle their whole life because the one who grows is a person who got the reality, the revelation of how to grow. They got the revelation. I don't know if you ever watched a video. I watched a video years ago about uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was just an everyday, fat, dumpy young man. And Arnold got a hold of a magazine, and he saw these, these men that were just strapping with muscles and, and brimming, and he got it in his head, I want to become like that, and he began. And it was a slow, progressive growth. It was a painful growth, but Arnold began to lift weights, and Arnold began to diet, and Arnold began to run, and Arnold began to pick up small weights, and he began to, and things began to happen in his physical body. He began to go through a process of developing and molding and shaping his physical body. Now, bodily exercise profiteth nothing, very little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. To the life that now is and is to come. Notice it affects the life to come. Oh, my. And there is no limit to how you can grow spiritually. And it's not about you. It's all about him. So Jesus at 30 years old, the father says, Now humble yourself, son. 
And he's in perfect tune. Yes, Father. He always said, yes, Father. And he went, and John the Baptist argued with him. He knew who he was. He said, wait, I, sh I should be being baptized by you. I'm not worthy to untie your shoes. He said, no, suffer to be so, for all scripture will be fulfilled. And as he was baptized of John the Baptist, he came up out of the water, a perfect, perfect human being in every regards, the perfect nature of God, the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And so when you look at Jesus, you want to become like Jesus? Look at Jesus. You want to walk where Jesus walked? You want to do what Jesus did? You want to move where Jesus moved? Look at him. He is the pattern. He is the statue. He is the standard. Jesus is the standard for the believer. Come up to the standard. Come up to it. Don't let the devil tell you that you can't be perfect. And I'm talking about mature, developed, shaped, and molded. A little here and a little there, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And for those of you who are watching and listening, you can obtain it. You can possess it. You can have it. It is your destiny. Throughout eternity, we will be just like Jesus. I'm telling you, you will be just like Jesus. Now, we're little. He's big. He will. It says the disciple can never be greater than his master, but he can be equal to it. Now, when I say equal, Jesus told us, I want you to be just like me. I'm your example. I'm your illustration. I'm your pattern. I'm your standard. Here's the standard. You, did you know what they've done in our public schools and our colleges? Because people can't live up to the standards they did 40, 50 years ago. In the major high schools of America, in the cities, they cannot even read and write. They've lowered the standards, and they've lowered the standards, and they've lowered the standards. And you would think the world is crazy, but we've done it in the church. We've lowered the standards. We need to put them back where they belong. My standard, it says, don't compare yourself one to another because you're carnal. Paul said, I'd give you meat, but I can't. He said, I can't give you meat. You're not mature enough. Mature, hey, meat is for mature people. Mature people. And, and I've been accused of choking people. And I said, well, listen, I, I, I'm just ministering what God's telling me to minister. And, and I know God wants and God is demanding me to come up to a higher standard and never to come back. Never come back. Enoch walked with God when he was 300 some years old. And he got it in his head, I want to walk with God. Get it in your heart. Get it in your mind. Get it in your soul. I want to walk with God. I want to know this God, Paul said, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And I haven't even got into my notes. <laughs> haven't even got into my I want to challenge you today. You are called to be sons and daughters of God. Now you are. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We will see him as he is, and every man that has this purpose, this hope, purifies himself. I'm not purifying you. With the washing of the water of the word, with the cleansing of the word, sanctified by the truth, by the truth, by the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. You can be sanctified. You can be set apart. You can uh, be holy. You can be perfect as he is holy. Be perfect, even as, what a challenge. And, and then so I got down to this meeting, and uh, Patty ministered all the things she went through and how her husband died, and, it didn't, and, she was just a, and she was just a housewife and preached with her husband, and she just got this tenacity, and, and God woke her up when her husband died, terrible, terrible disease, born again, spirit filled, went to the same school I did, and the Lord said, get up and go. What are you doing? You got a job to do, a purpose. Get up. Get up. Stand on your feet. Stop acting like a baby. And so she had a, a child who had autism. Uh, any excuse you could think of not succeeding, that woman had it. But you know what? She had something else in her. She had a divine faith, a divine tenacity. I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I cannot quit. I will not quit, and I cannot be defeated. Did you know that? You will not be defeated if you won't quit. Yeah, but what? But about her husband? He's in glory. He's in glory. He's attained. That's wonderful. But we're still here. And so she shared that story I went back to, and she didn't talk about what I'm talking about tonight. But I went back to my hotel room, and the Lord spoke to me the word perfect. And I looked this up, and I began to think about, oh, look at all the times it tells us that it says, instructing every man 
that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Warning every man, instructing every man, every man, that they might be perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm called to instruct you to be mature, to be developed, to come up to his standard, to be Jesus in the earth, but Jesus inside of you. That's what discipleship is. But I can't bring you where I don't live. <laughs> so that puts responsibility on me. And that puts responsibility on you. The church has got to come up to the standard. We've lowered our standard. And you can see it in the way we dress, in the way we talk, in the things we watch, and the things we go after, and the things we do. Come up to the standard. And Christ is my standard. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So I got back, and, and I didn't have my laptop with me or nothing. I just had my phone, and I had my Bible, and I'm writing notes. I'm writing notes all night long. You know, Kathy goes to sleep. I wake up on the mat. Perfect, perfect. Be perfect. And God is really saying, come on, son. Come on. Press towards the mark. Press in. Grow up. Mature. Develop. Get back to where you've been before and go way beyond that. Come on, come on. And, and I'm agreeing with him now. I'm saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He says, I want to use you as an example, and I will use anybody as an example that gets this heart. I want to be perfect. But if you're going to become mature, there's things you've got to put away. When I was a child, I speak as a child, I understood as a child, of other, but when I became a man, I put away, I put away. But I'll tell you what, the, the benefits are out of this world, and the benefits are in this present world. So when you get into a place where you're walking in harmony with God, you're in tune with God, you're in step with God, all of a sudden, God shows up. You're not working it up, you're not hamming it up, you're not shouting him down, even though you can shout. I think I'm getting a little bit loud tonight. I get excited. I'm not dancing him down. I might dance. I might pray. But I get into the place where the father looks down on his son, and he says, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And here comes the Holy Ghost. A baptism of power and fire comes on Jesus. Now, Jesus could have had the Holy Ghost from the moment he was conceived in his mother's womb because in his character and his nature and his personality, he was sinless. He was perfect. He was perfect. You understand what I'm saying? Now, the good news is God doesn't wait for you to reach that maturity before he gives you the Holy Ghost. I have led people to the Lord. My wife and I walked into Jay Thompson's business one day, Janet and Jay. Uh, he used to be our, uh, our, our uh, children's pastor here uh, while he was our, over our school. And I walked in, and here's a woman who's, uh, uh, she's gothic. She's probably in her late 40s, and, and, and she's got a black dress on and black eyelashes and black lipstick. I mean, she's gothic. And Jay's standing there, and I look at her, and I heard the word of the Lord, and I say, today is her day. I heard him. My wife can attend. I heard the Lord say, today is her day. I said, okay, Lord, tell me what. He said, lead her to the Lord into the Holy Ghost right now. So I stopped her. I said, I know what you've been looking for your whole life. And I can't tell you everything I said because it was by the Spirit. She began to cry. I said, it's time to get right with God. I said, I, I said I'm going to lead you to Jesus. I'm going to lay my hands on you. You're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Oh, okay, okay. So she lifted her hands, and I led her to Jesus, and I led her into the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues where just she'd she been speaking satanic stuff just a couple minutes later, and she began to go to Brother Jay's church the next Sunday. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. But see, I'm perfectly in tune. See, I'm after God's heart. I'm after God's heart. How about that song? I'm after your heart. I'm after your heart. Lord, I'm after your heart. Whew. It's our destiny, people. Why are we letting the world, the flesh, and the devil rob us from our high calling in Christ Jesus? It's a high calling. Not very many are going to make it, very few. Why? Why are, we, why, why are we doing an Esau? Why sell your birthright? Jacob wanted it. Jacob was not the firstborn. Watch this. God skipped over Jacob. I mean, not Jacob, but Esau. Esau was the firstborn. 
but Esau didn't want it. God told the Israelites that. He said, listen, he said, Gentiles are going to get in before you people. You think you got it. You think you're the cat's meow? He said, and the Gentiles are going to jump in there and grab what you don't want because of your unbelief. Let's take a hold of what belongs to us. We'll pick this up another day. Let's, let's take a hold of what belongs to us. You're called to a higher place, another dimension, another realm. You're called to walk where Jesus walked. You're called to think like Jesus thought. You're ta- called to speak like Je- Jesus spoke to the fig tree, cursed it. We could talk about the fig tree. Why did he curse the fig tree? It wasn't producing. God said, I want fruit. He said, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you and ordained you that you would go forth and bring forth much fruit. Say much fruit. Will you reach up and grab that tonight? Much fruit. Much fruit, much fruit. I want much fruit. I want much fruit. I want much. I'm not even talking about how many people are going to get saved or healed. I'm talking about the divine nature, the character, the personality, the attitude, the desires. It's time for the church. It's in the pig pen. I'm hearing the Lord say, I am going to wake up my people like I did that prodigal son who was in the pig pen. And they will wake up and they will have a heart broken over what they've done. And they will acknowledge they've sinned against their heavenly father. They've sinned against God. And they will crawl out of the pig pen. And one little step at a time, they're going to run home. And the Father will be there to meet you with a robe of authority, with a ring, with a robe of his glory, his ring of authority, his shoes on your feet. He, he's already killed the fatted lamb. His name is Jesus. There's already been a place prepared for you at the table. We just got to go back home. I hear the Lord say by the Holy Ghost, come home, come home, come home, my people, come home. Do you not hear my beckoning voice? Can you not see I have a table prepared for you in the presence of your enemies? Come home and sit down and be seated. For I've called you to be kings and priests more than conquerors and overcomers, heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. Come home, it's time. It's time to come home, people. It's time to come home. Stop drinking at the well of the world. Stop. It's full, of, I had a friend of mine, Mike Antonelli, he was told not to drink the water in the Philippines. He thought it was spiritual, he drank it. Evangelist, powerful evangelist. I knew him before I met Kathy. Matter of fact, I wanted to make sure it was God that God, God was giving me Kathy because I heard the Lord say that's your wife. Well, you know what I did? Stupid Mike. I went to Mike and, I, and Mike Antonelli. I said, Mike, do you see that blonde, blue eyed? She'd make you a good wife. That's what I said. How stupid can you be? Now, God told me she was going to be my wife, but I was trying the waters. Mike Antonelli looked at me and he said, God told me I can't, I can't. I said, why? She's yours. I said, whoa. I said, woo. So Mike got over the Philippines and they told him, don't drink the water out here. Well, we, got, we got warm soda and other beverages that have gone through a perfect, oh, I can handle it. And he drank the water and he got a terrible, terrible uh, uh, parasites in him. Got back to America Ended up in the hospital, didn't have insurance, had to pay hospital bills. Listen to this. So his car insurance ran out. And one day he's going down the road and had a terrible car accident, and he didn't have no insurance. Got in big trouble, destroyed his ministry, and I've never heard from him again in over 35 years. 35 years. Because he wasn't listening to God it's only God's mercy I'm still here I'll tell you that right now I wrote I wrote a book about it I need God because I'm stupid 
And don't look at me so innocent. You've done a lot of stupid stuff too. But we're still alive and we're still breathing and we're still kicking. Will you close your eyes? I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray for this little flock. Lord, I pray for those who will be watching this video and those who will see it by technology. And I pray that even as that prodigal son woke up in the pig's pen and he got up and he got his eyes, he got it into his heart and his mind, I'm going home. And that's all that was in his mind and his heart. I'm going home to daddy. I'm going home to papa. I'm going home to my wonderful father who was always so good to me. We're talking about the father of light. So I pray that even now there would be an awakening of your church and they would get it in their heart and their mind. I'm going home in Jesus name. <laughs> grab that, grab that. Say, I'm going home. <laughs> See, I've, I've I've walked with God all these years, but I just do my own little side, my little side journeys. Anybody ever do a little side journey, just a little shortcut? How many ever did it? I'm famous for my shortcuts. Before we got GPSs, my kids would almost groan when I'd say, I'm taking their shortcut, and they'd beg me, Dad, don't, Dad, don't, and it should have been there in a half an hour, and two and a half hours later, we got there. How many shortcuts have we thought we were taking? I've watched the church take a lot of shortcuts Oh, this mystery and this secret and that and this and this. But I, I've always seen because I knew what God did to me and how God's done through me because I know what the answer is. What, I, what the answer is, what I just shared with you tonight. It is Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus. If he's ever been more real to you than he is right now, get back. Let Jesus, and you know what? The devil will rob you. I talked to a young man this morning, and this is, and I knew where he was headed. I know he used to go to our school, and he told me, young man, crying, weeping after service. He said, Pastor Mike, I just don't know if I can get back. I said, listen to what you did. I said, I'm going to tell you what you did. You took your eyes out of the Bible, and you began to listen to all these preachers. Yeah, I did. I was just, I was just you know, searching on YouTube. I said, they took you away from Jesus, and they got you on all kinds of little side trips. He said, I don't even know. I don't even know if I believe in God anymore. I said, oh, it's in you. I said, but you fed the spirit of unbelief. I said, now you've got to crucify it. And I said, there's only one way you're going to crucify it, and that's you've got to get back into the word. And you've got to believe. The minute that a preacher disagrees with the character, the nature, the personality, the heart of God, I, I don't come against them, but I, I, I want the truth. I can't afford to get worms. Mike Antonelli, he got parasites. It destroyed him. I cannot afford to do that.